Hello, this is Monica Bessem, and this is my presentation for my lesson plan um, for my final project for the American West class with Dr. Duarte. My topic is on the outsiders on the borders, Chinese immigrants in the Southwest based off of the and inspired by Julian Lim's porous borders. Who, where, when, and why? Using porous borders by Julian Lim to see the foundation of diversity, especially the Chinese immigrant how they were an integral part of the border towns, their hard work and labor that then migrated into the communities. Also the displacing of when they were deemed illegal to both the United States and Mexico. Julian Lim describes the borders and the people there, the uncommon knowledge that there were Chinese immigrants that were immersed and even spoke Spanish. Quote from page 53. To counter this growing depopulation, Mexican elites debated the desirability of Chinese immigrant labor, small but significant numbers of which had been imported in Mexico beginning in the 1860s. The diplomatic official Matias Romero pushed for recruiting Chinese colonists as early as 1875, pointing to the great population of vast empire. The fact that many of them are agriculturalists, the relatively low wages they earn, and the proximity of our coast to Asia. It also helped that the Chinese, according to Romero, bore a comfortable resemblance to the original race of our Indians. This is not an idle dream, he continued. Chinese immigration has been going on for years, and wherever it has occurred prudently, the results have been favorable. For elites fashioning 167 for elites fashioning Mexico's modernization, the United States, one of the places in which Chinese immigration had occurred prudently, and with favorable results, providing a tempting model. Indeed, some insisted on adopting American economic ways, expertise, and technology, rationalizing that by Americanizing ourselves, we Mexicanize ourselves more and more. Supposedly docile, cheap, and exploitable, the Chinese were thus pinned as an ideal for the railroad workforce in Mexico, as well, and large numbers of the Chinese already in the southwestern United States were recruited by the Mexico, Mexican Central to build the railroad linking Ciudad Juarez to Mexico City. Governor Terrazas may have driven the first spike into Juarez in 1881, but once the ceremonies were over, it took the work of the imported laborers, including large numbers of Chinese, to finish the road three years later. So we see in the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, here provided, um, this is the actual document provided by the governmentdocs.com. This halted all Chinese immigrants from entering. Also, what does the transcript read about those that are already here? I would like to make a copy of this for part of the lesson plan and have the students go over and read and see the explanation that they are now deemed illegal for even owning property, any of their status, and it really affects a lot of the people in the communities. Here is a map provided of the Chinese population per county in 1880. And we see here that California, Nevada, um, Utah, the Southwest, that there's quite immersed. Texas doesn't have much. Um, and that there was a great presentation and link um, to maps as well on the El Paso Chinatown of the 1880s. This is a wonderful um, presentation by a student on the Chinese diaspora at UNM. And he has a wonderful, wonderful presentation of those Chinese people that had actually created communities here in New Mexico as well, and their familial history. One of my other supporting resources, one of my two other supporting resources is by um, Delgado, Grace Delgado, Making the Chinese Mexican Global Migration, Localism and Exclusion in the US-Mexico Borderlands. Out of chapter four, I would like to have my students summarize, analyze, and do a group discussion who had the right, what were their motives? But here's an excerpt from um, page 105. Far from provoking moral outrage, the massacre at Torreon sparked more anti-Chinese violence throughout Mexico. In the first year of the revolution, Mexican rebels and unknown individuals, 324 Chinese residents, murders of Chinese in Mexico continued throughout the nation, especially in large cities. By 1919, anti-Chinese fervor had contributed to the deaths of 129 Chinese in Mexico City and 373 in Piedras Negras, Cahula. These deaths did not occur in isolation. They resulted from the culmination of a nationalistic campaign that played on the anxieties that Mexicans harbored about their own economic security, their racial integrity, and their role in the revolutionary project. That the rhetoric of this xenophobia 
inspired nationalism would ultimately lead to the bloodshed should have come as no surprise to anyone observing it. In Sonora, the cauldron of revolutionary violence was stirred most vehemently by Jose Maria Arana, a Magdalena school teacher and businessman. Arana and his followers shared a commitment to imposing and sustaining an anti-Chinese rhetoric based on racial ideals that subsumed insidiously women's political equality. The anti-Chinistas spurred the passage of draconian labor, public hygiene, and marriage laws and enforced them with brutal vigilantism. The anti-Chinese ferocity in Sonora came to violent fruition under unrelenting political pressure from these anti-Chinistas and their supporters. So this shows that after that exclusion act that there just became a growing, excuse me, not only after the anti-exclusion act, act did was there a growing tension um that now that they were illegal but also there came down the revolution in mexico and that's part of this um continued hatred towards outsiders it was spurred by the government next we would use a secondary source um also to look at summarizing analyzing and discussing and then i would like the students to go over both um, readings and see what they can glean from it. So this one is provided by um, Elliot Young. It's called Alienation, Chinese Migration in the Americas from the Cooley Era through World War II. In 1906, King wrote to President Roosevelt lauding him for his intervention on behalf of Chinese merchants, diplomats, and students during the 1905 boycott of U.S. goods, but also criticizing the harsh enforcement of the Exclusion Act. As King put it, the future historian will marvel why the enlightened American who perm is it's the free dumping of the riffraff and offscoring of Europe, who welcomes the assisted immigration of Europe, paupers and criminals should single out the Chinese for exclusion. Kang pointedly condemned the United States not for excluding poor people and criminals, but lumping all Chinese together as an undesirable class. Also, there is a um, American experience on the Chinese diaspora. And so we would take this as well as the local UNM students um, presentation and look deeper into these people that were here and they were creating and they were part of the American framework. They weren't outsiders. They had fully immersed themselves into our communities and were living um, side by side by people before we decided that they were now considered illegal or dangerous. The learning tools that I would use is to create a weekly packet that would be distributed um, at the start of the week. So we would have a fact sheet of the timeline and previous history that we would be studying leading up to the Chinese immigrants. Maps of the borders to be colored signifying timeline of where the border lines continue to shift, which we will also see a video of, and a word search with glossary terms after reading sources. So we might look up stuff like diaspora. We would look up um, xenophobia, which is the Asian fear or fear of people from the Pacific. We would also discuss um, some of the terms that they use, um, Spanish terms that, that were used to describe these people. This is a wonderful video. Um, I don't know if it'll work here. It is watching the nation develop to better understand the borders and perspective to the timeline. This shows us um, where the borders were, the territories. And right here we see that the vice royalty of New Spain went all the way up. So when we try to act like we were such an American nation that was composed, we need to go back and look at this history here and see that we're still not even considered part of the U.S. territory yet. We're moving forward and moving faster. Now we're all Mexico here, Republic of Texas. So we're seeing how this, this changing landscape um, is taking place and how these ideas come down. And now we have California. So this is another great representation for a learning tool for students that learn and develop in a different way. Instead of just reading the text, they can now pinpoint the history and the terms and the ideals of the changing landscape. Let's see if we can get it here to about 1911 when the revolution happened in Mexico and kind of see what's going there. Okay, New Mexico territory. Now we're New Mexico state and here we go. Thank you. So that was my 
my presentation packet for my lesson plan. This lesson plan, due to its content and its um, its violence that would come with any enslavement of a people and determination that they do not belong in a nation is going to be graphic and there's going to be descriptions that I don't believe younger kids should hear. So this would be a secondary education lesson plan, most likely for upper divisions of high school or late middle school. Thank you.